Good morning. All right. Good to have you guys here this morning. Come on in and have a seat. We're going to get started. Uh, we've got a lot of things happening this morning, so uh, and we've got a special uh, treat for you. Is uh, Pastor Justin's going to preach this morning, and uh, so we're excited to hear from him this morning. And um, so let me remind you again, if you are interested in, in uh, volunteering in the C4 uh, class one time, you don't have to do it all the time and just try it, see if you like it. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet right in there, and uh, uh, we would love for you to join in and fill those gaps. So, very good. Um, we had a couple of birthdays this week. Uh, my buddy Daniel in the back, raise your hand, Daniel. He's turned 20 years old this week. 20 years old. That's amazing. All right. Uh, so, yeah, so if it's your birthday this week, uh, happy birthday to you. We love you. And uh, what's that? Yeah, Whitney Galloway. I feel like she doesn't want to talk about her birthday, so I wasn't going to mention it, but thank you, Nancy. <laughs> but, uh, yep, and uh, Justin's and Colt and, and um, the whole family, Jordan and them, they've been celebrating together. I'm not, dude, dude, stop talking. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not going to talk about that. So, anyway, if you're here for the first time, thank you so much for visiting with us. Uh, many for the second time. And uh, watching online, we appreciate it. I know Jesse and them, their crew, they're probably watching from Illinois. So we love you guys. Come back safe. And uh, let's go ahead and stand up. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll start worship songs and uh, give some praise and glory to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your truth. I pray that you would have your hand upon us this, this morning as we worship, as we meditate on your word, on your truth, on your faithfulness. Lord, we just give you glory and praise this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's worship.
singing this morning. You can have a seat. All right. That was a, that was a song that they've been practicing for a while. Uh, but uh, to be a child of the, of the king, it's different. Uh, it's a different perspective when we're looking through the lens of the gospel and, and everything. Whether we are going to the grocery store just to get groceries or if we're looking at it through the lens of the gospel, we're going to the grocery store to get groceries with an opportunity to share the gospel. Everything is changed. The gospel changes everything. And so through that, uh, we, we are never, we are never where we can just, I'm going to take it easy on the gospel today. I think I'll just put it to the side today and just do what I want to do. We don't have that luxury as a child of God. The Bible says to count the cost and to know that the suffering that we struggle with, the things that we deal with each and every day in our life, whether it's physical, uh, spiritual, emotional, those, all of those things are, are pointing us to Christ, identifying with Christ through our sufferings. That's what James talks about in chapter 1. And, in, and we, we give glory to Him. Our temporary pain is the ultimate to His eternal glory, for His glory, for His honor. In Luke 2 last week, we looked at it last week. What did the angel say? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. So, amen. Amen. Oh, boy. Here we go. Amen, preacher. All right. We got one. All right. Appreciate that. If you're here for the first time, if you would just slip your hands up. We've got an usher in the back. They want to put a card in your hand. Thank you so much for being here. John, I think it is. And we're, we're proud to say he's from Canada. And we're thankful for you to be here this morning. And uh, if you would, at the end of the service, John, we'd like to meet you in the back. We've got a gift to give you. And uh, if we didn't give you one last year, we won't give you one this year. Uh, so just meet us in the back at the end of the service. Really looking forward to hearing Justin preach this week. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's been digging in the Word and uh, thankful for that. Um, just so you know, uh, this is Pastor Fred, and uh, he's another pastor that uh, ministers here. These guys, Pastor Justin, myself, Pastor Fred, uh, they, they help carry the load. They, they are amazing, and I appreciate them, uh, their willingness at, at any drop of the hat to do whatever is needed. Uh, Justin works about 1,000 hours a week, uh, and, but yet he still finds time to, to, to minister and to serve. And uh, Fred is full-time retired and is loving it. And uh, if he would, if I had him, he would be up here every, every week, every day of the week, doing whatever. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know, he's got to make sure that Marlene's taken care of. So, uh, but uh, we appreciate them, and I appreciate their willingness to, to jump in and preach and, and be excited. Uh, so, what's next? Offering. Okay, let's stand up. Let's, let's get our... Uh, huh? Huh? What do I do that first or that? See, Justin, man, I don't know how to do this, man. I, I'm good at one thing, maybe. Let's roll the announcements, and then we'll do the offering. How's that? All right. you're here. If you are a first-time guest, we would like to offer you a small gift. 
So after the service, so after the service please meet one of our pastors in the welcome corner in the back. If you're joining us online, if you're joining us online welcome. We would like for you to like or subscribe and then click on that connection card and let us know just a little bit about yourself. And then if you have a prayer or a need, man, we would love to pray for you. So just let us know. covenant we believe that worship is in fact an act of putting God first in everything you do including your giving and there are several ways you could give here you could give the old fashioned way and put something in the offering basket when it comes around you could drop it in the mail you could go online at our website or you could use the tithe app. whatever you choose we'll appreciate it and God will be blessed do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength With the announcements, let me just add a few things. Uh, I believe next week we'll have our financial statement for uh, this quarter, and uh, you'll be happy to uh, pick one up and uh, be as nosy as you want to be. We're, we're transparent. We're open, especially if you're uh, an a active giver to, uh, to New Covenant Church. And on the back of that financial statement, you will also see um, a list of 15 or so things uh, of what we do regularly to, to give in our community. Uh, the missionaries that we support, um, several of those we just took on a new missionary, uh, Vincent and Brittany Blanchard to China, and uh, this young man was with us about three or four months ago, and uh, solid young man, he came and stayed at our house, and we took him in, and uh, his wife was with child, so she couldn't make the trip. They have since given birth to a beautiful baby girl, and uh, so we're thankful for them, continue to be praying for them, they'll be on the missionary board. Uh, out there, Pastor Fred, if you have any questions, he's in charge of all the uh, outreach with the mission work. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we want to ask prayer for, for, the Vin for Vincent and Brittany and their children, is um, they've closed China off, as we all know, because of COVID. And uh, so Vincent has a degree uh, in um, business that you, have to, you can't just go into China and say, hey, I'm here to give you the gospel, uh, because they'll pretty much put you in prison for that. Uh, so he has to go in with a different, uh, uh, a different description. So he's going to go in as a business major, and uh, but until they close, they, until they open up China, um, the Lord uh, directed them to the Virginia Tech area. Well, it just so happens there's about, I don't know if he said five or ten thousand Chinese students in the Virginia Tech campus, and so he is ministering to those there. Uh, the Chinese there in America and Virginia Tech while he's waiting to get into China to minister to the Chinese and give them the gospel. So uh, pretty amazing how the Lord works. And, uh, and sometimes we question those, those what seems to be a failure on our end. Well, I can't make it. They're at 82%, I believe it is. And uh, we've taken them on as well as many churches have. And... Um, uh, so let's be praying for the Blanchard family as they're uh, waiting for the doors to open in China. But while they're waiting, they're, they're working. They're giving God glory. They're ministering uh, to the Chinese there at the Virginia Tech campus, the students. And uh, it's a wide open field. Amen? All right. Let's do this. Is it time for the offering now? Okay. Let's give. Let's do that. Let's stand to our feet. And uh, in a couple weeks, you're going to be seeing a lot of sign-up sheets all over the place. We're going to be talking about... Uh, Miss Whitney's Bible study that's going to be started for the ladies. Uh, Miss Diane Garforth's Bible study, uh, which is a precept study. Uh, and then our DMD session uh, will be re restarting again. Some of you have asked, can I take the class again? The, act the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, you're welcome to do that. If you need a refresher, uh, you're welcome to do that. But uh, we are encouraging everybody that is considered a covenant partner uh, to, to sit in on that class uh, and see what we are about. This is what our church is about. Disciples who make disciples. Y'all hear what I'm saying? 
disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We don't just make disciples. We make disciple makers. Y'all hear me real, real good. Because there's a big difference. We've been trained in America for the last 70 years to 100 years that you come to church on Sunday and that is the extent of your discipling. It's a, it's a, a small part. What you're doing is you're coming in and you're hearing the gospel, you're hearing the word of God, and you're receiving knowledge. But there's, there's a more than that when that knowledge can be reproduced so that you can do what I am doing. Now, I've been in ministry for 28 years, and I've been to college and seminary and all that other jazz. And uh, there's no way I could take, come here, Jordan, come here, Jordan. Oh, I'm so excited about this young man. I love this young man. I, it didn't start out too well. <laughs> but this young man it fell in love with my daughter. And for a while, uh, I heard it described as a pebble in my boot. Y'all know what that is? And then, I, and then the Lord really began to um, break my heart for Jordan. And the game changer was when God started breaking my heart for his salvation. And through being exposed to my daughter and, and her upbringing and her knowledge of God's word and his desire. Um, and I had gone through the training before we even started training. I was going through the training with Justin and Pastor Fred. And, and um, they challenged me to reach out to this joker and grab a burger and share the three circles, which is a way to share the gospel. And he gets in the truck with me one Sunday after church, and we drive to uh, the Red Robin. That's one of his favorite spots. And before we could even get there, he's asking me questions. And he literally said, I want Jesus in my life. And I started like thinking, now wait a minute now. I've been trained to do this story, my story, God's story, three circles. You got to wait your turn. I want to do my part, but you know what? If you really knew how little we are, we are needed when the Spirit of God is operating, the, the worst thing we could do is jump in and do our thing. And this young man outside of the uh, Red Robin in the parking lot in my little 2009 GMC truck, he bowed his head in the passenger seat, and he asked Jesus to be Lord and King of his life. Thank you, Jordan. You can have a seat. And we went through the DMD book, and he's been struggling, struggling well, but he's struggling, just like all of us. And the enemy's been attacking him. The enemy's been attacking his family. And the enemy's been attacking his relationships. And the enemy's been attacking his workplace. And that's all the enemy knows how to do, right? But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's a reference to the prince and power of the air. See, we serve the God of peace. The king of kings means he's the king of all the kings and the Lord of all the lords. Isaiah describes him as mighty counselor, wonderful, prince of peace, he is everything we need, and we don't even know it when we need it. But he says, I'll step in and be that for you. I am the all-sufficient one. What a God we serve. So if you are interested in that, uh, the DMD, that'll be signing up. That sign-up sheet will be coming about mid-August. So a lot of things happening. Uh, be praying for all of our families. As you can see, there's a lot of them out of town this week. Uh, but just like Miss Nancy said this morning, everybody is here, supposed to be here, is here this morning. And we're going to encourage each other in the Lord. And the body of Christ is going to do our part. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. I'm so in love with your word because your word is your mind on paper. And we believe with all our hearts, Lord, that your word is true. It is absolute. And Lord, we know that you poured in, you breathed in the Spirit of God in those men writing these words. And Lord, we know that there is no contradiction. And we are thankful that our hope is not in a translation. Our hope is in the God of the Bible. 
And Lord, we love you and we honor you this morning. We magnify your name. And Lord, we lift you up. We're doing this morning what we would really like to do and are struggling to do all throughout the week when we are not together. Lord, when I'm on my own and I'm in this community and I get so frustrated and I lose my temper, I lose my cool, I say things I shouldn't say, and Lord, I struggle in my flesh. But when I get amongst God's people, when I get amongst the body of Christ, I get empowered, I get instructed, I get encouraged, I get lifted up to see you doing the same thing with God's people that you do with me during the week. And to look over and see these folks that have struggled all week and they're still here. And Lord, I pray that you would have your hand upon every heart and life this morning. As Pastor Justin comes and preaches from your word this morning, encourages our heart, instructs us, and, and might even need to do some correcting in our life, Lord. We leave that up to the Holy Spirit. We are open this morning to hearing from you this morning. And we thank you for that. Bless this offering. Use it for your glory. Use it for your honor. Use it for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The name above every name. Amen and amen. Let's give this morning in worship.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Those that are in C4 can go to C4. Scott and April will be waiting on you over there. You'll be in for a treat over there today with them. Let's see if we can get this thing to stick with me. Got to get in the center. I'll be throwing some people off if I'm not in the center. It is an honor and a privilege to have the chance to preach this morning. Fred, I'm trying to go high tech with you today. I'm using the tablet. So if it messes up, I'm gonna do, we'll see how that works. What'd you say? Be Fred's fault. Be Fred's fault. I'm good with that. So um, let me just throw out something. Um, Scott talked about our DMD training, our Timothy initiative, our disciples making disciples. Talk to some of the ones who went through it. It is a mindset change. It is a heart change when you start going through it and you start realizing what the Bible says about making disciples, about witnessing to people. The whole purpose behind it, one of the things that was said is this is different than other discipleship programs because this is discipleship with accountability. Church I grew up in, they did good years ago and they set up a discipleship training for people and they required the whole church to go through it. But their discipleship training was a 12-week program where you sit down with somebody, somebody in church and they went through this booklet with you about why we believe what we believe, which was good because a lot of churches don't even do that. But the emphasis in that was not on making other disciples. It was on going through the materials so that you know what you believe, which is, is great. We all need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Sarah and I got rid of all my stuff this morning except for this, so you don't have to hold things for me this week. <laughs> Last time she had keys and a cell phone, and actually she had both my cell phones, and she had her hands full of stuff to hang on for me. So, But it changes your heart and your mindset. And one of the things right off the bat is they want you to write down a list of 30 people. 30 people in your life that you're going to start praying for that you're not 100% sure that they're saved. And some people say, well, I can't come up with 30 people. Well, it's okay. Write down the ones you know and ask God to fill the rest of them. And it starts changing how you think about things. It starts changing how you look at people around you. And it starts teaching you how to share your story in a minute, two minutes. How to share God's story in a minute or two minutes. Because as you go up to a clerk somewhere at a, at a restaurant or you're checking out at Walmart and you just feel the Holy Spirit leading you to do it, it's not like you've got to shut her line down for 10 minutes while you tell her all your details of your past. And it's one of the amazing things about it is it gives you the opportunity to share with them what God's done for you. So if you've not done it, if you've done it and need a refresher, by all means jump in on it. I can't wait to go back through it again. Um, I had the honor and privilege of, of doing the majority of the teaching this past time. Um, Scott and Fred was in there with me. They helped out with a lot of stuff. They covered on the weeks I couldn't be here. And um, I'm very thankful for their support on that. But please, pray about that. It is something that is just amazing. A.L.'s over here shaking his head. He understands that. He shared the gospel with somebody on the beach and drew it in the sand. Um, Miss Janet, who's not here, she did it visually in her mind to somebody over the phone. Miss Marlene back there got to go through the program and God gave her the chance while this was going on to lead her dad to Christ. I mean, there's just opportunities left and right. Gave David the ability to send it out with an email and you sent it to like, what, 5,000 people on his email list from his report. Never know what God can do with you. So we're going to jump in this week at Luke chapter 2. And I'll just forewarn you, we're in verses, we're going to use verses 21 to 39. 21 to 39. So if you uh, get a chance to read along with me, um, I'm going to do my best. And I am going to read all of the verses to begin with, and then we're going to jump in to some things that God's gave me out of that. And for those of you looking at it, I don't, it doesn't matter what translation you use, that's between you and God. I grew up using the old King James. That's what, I was, what I'm comfortable with, so that's what I'm going to use today. Um, if you use something else, there, you may have a little... I have a little odd struggle at time when somebody's using something else, keeping up with them. But, you know, I've got all the verses up here. If you've got your Bible, stick with me. If you've got the, if you've got the app, 
Stick with me because there's some stuff in this that God just really rocked my heart with this week that I want to try to share with you. Verse 21. Now, they talk, Scott talked to last week about the birth of Jesus. And he was just born. He was born in the manger. And here we go in just after this. And they've just given birth. And he says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, talking back into Exodus and the book of Levit uh, Leviticus and all that, as he opened, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to, the, to that which is in, said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or, a pair, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God, and said, Lord, now let us thou, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now, catch this. They marveled at the things that were spoken of him. If you've got your Bible or whatever, look back at verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And Mary kept all these things, all the things that the, that the, that the shepherds and them had came in and was telling about what the angels told them. She said, she kept it in her heart. So now in this one, they're seeing what's going on and both of them are stepping back going, Interesting. We knew what Gabriel said. Now, 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 now this is just adding to it. And Simeon, he continues on, he said, And Simeon blessed them, the mother and father, and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the raising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through his own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was, a, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Average age during those times to get married was around 15 or 16. So from the age of 22, and she was about four score and four years. She was 84 at this time. You do the math. Which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake unto him uh, unto them all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. Jesus, I need your help. I cannot give them what they need. I don't have that ability, Lord. That comes from you. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need your guidance, your wisdom, your knowledge. Please, Spirit, move all over this place. I know that you're here already, Lord. I know that you're with us. I know that you've already inhabited this place, Father. So God, from one side to the other, from Bob all the way out into the foyer where Jimmy and, and, and the others are out out there. Sit down in this place. Sit down beside and inside each one's heart. Reach back into that nursery where my baby and my girl were at. And there with Sammy and with those young, precious young ones that's in there with them. Minister to them. Encourage them. Scott and April over there in C4. Help what you've given them today, Lord, to speak to those young hearts and lives that are in there. God, we're not here for show. We're not here for anybody to leave here and say, 
wow, he did a good job. We're in here to be with you. We're in here together with our family. God, I got to have you. You spoke to my heart this week with this father. Please share everything with them today. For the ones that are online, God, may this be a time for them just to turn away from whatever else is going on to have time just with you, Lord. We ask this for your glory and honor and only for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This week was an amazing week for me. Actually, the last two weeks, I had weekend duty this past weekend, but we had settled it with Scott and him a couple weeks ago that I would come in and preach this Sunday. Unfortunately, I'll be on weekend duty next weekend. Um, so I'm here, in, here a week, gone a week, gone again. So, But I started studying this. David, the more I started reading this, there were things in it that started jumping out at me. But I want to share some things that God gave me out of this, some examples that God gave me out of these people's lives. And me and Whitney and Colt and Jordan was talking last night. We carried Whitney out to eat, and then we went to play putt-putt, and she beat the pants off all three of us. Um, me and Jordan tied for third, and uh, Colt hit some, he hit some hole-in-ones that I'm sitting here going, seriously? And... Jordan cracked me up because she's, you know, she has a super competitive side for the ones who played volleyball with her. Um, Saren can tell you that. She scared Scott a while back. We were playing volleyball at the house, and the way she ran up to the net had him moving and jerking, but she's kind of halfway doing it, and it was just an amazing time. And I was sharing some of this with them on the way back, and I, talk, I mentioned it from the characters in this story. And Whitney goes, call them people. I said, okay, and she said, because when you call them characters, to me, it sounds like a fictitious story. It's like you're reading, you know, Great Expectations, and you're talking about Pip or, you know, Mrs. Habisham. They're characters. They're not real, genuine people. Yes, Bob, I read the book. <laughs> He's over grinning like, how'd you know that? It wasn't from the Cliff Notes. I actually read that one. Um, but some examples from the people we see in this. I've got three examples, and then... Charlie, hang on. There's something after this I want to get with you. I'm going to wait till the end to chase my rabbits, I hope. But I want to give you three examples. And the first one is the example of obedience. The example of obedience is found in verses 21 through 24. You know, there's pluses and minuses and curses to having little ears. I'm going to have to get tape and tape this joker on. You got any duct tape back there? We'll do it the cowboy way. We'll put some duct tape and baling wire on there. The examples of obedience found in verses 21 through 24, but it relates back to Leviticus chapter 2, or Leviticus 12, 2, 3, and 8. So if you turn to Leviticus, or if you see it, it says, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman shall have conceived a seed and born a man child, then, shall, then she shall be unclean for seven days, according to the days of separation, for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And then verse 8, And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement of her for her, and she shall be clean. So it says if you've got the money, you're supposed to bring a lamb offering or a bullock or something like that. If not, bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. We see the commands, and the, the following in this in verse 21, we see the commands to follow for the child. In the eighth day he shall be circumcised. They're setting an example to continue following the Levit Levitical law. They're setting the example to follow the things that they know and have been taught are right. We see the example for the mother. We see the example for the sacrifice. We see these things that we know we're supposed to do. And... When I read this, Miss Martha, it started digging in on me because I was sitting here thinking, you know, everybody talks about now, we hear things like common sense is no longer common sense, right? To get people to do the right thing, it's like twisting their arm to get them to do the right thing at times. How many red lights have you been at the last few days where it's red and then somebody blows through it? We've been here eight years now. Whitney's been rear-ended three different times. In eight years. It, you, you think about it. To do the right thing. Now, I'm not going to stand here in front of you and say that, you know, I don't speed. 
I stay under the speed limit, you know, all that. I'd be lying to you. I make that trip back and forth to Georgetown every day, and I do not set my cruise at the speed limit, David. That two miles at 55 and the 20 miles at 45, and especially going through Polly's, and then you hit 60 for the next five miles. And they're continuing in Polly's to stretch that out and make it slow. No, I don't do the speed limit all the way through there, so I'm not standing up here perfect in front of you. Scott, I'm, I'm the last one who wants to drive the speed limit. I do drive slower than others. It's not frequent. It's very frequent, Rick, that I get passed, but it's okay. They're usually the ones that get the ticket, and, you know, I get to keep on going. But it says to do the commands, to their example of obedience. How many times are we tested throughout the week to kind of slide to the side the things that we know we're supposed to do to just go along with things, to just move on with things, to not, not, not necessarily to drop our standards and our convictions, but just to move on a little bit and keep going so that we don't cause any ripples. We don't, we don't stir anything up. For the ones who are still at work and you've got people working for you, how often is it that you just, you just want to let that one little thing go because you don't want to do confrontation instead of doing what you know is right and handling it then? For the one that you know the things that you've been convicted in your heart or taught or the things that you know is right to push those aside because it's just not comfortable. It's just not comfortable. How many times do we deal with those things? And he's given us an example here of obedience. But the next one is the example of legacy or reputation. And if you look at verse 25b, the latter part of it, and 37b, 25, and Simeon, a just man, a, the same man, was just and devout. And then it moves on to talking about Anna and says, but served God with fasting and prayers daily. Now remember, she's, been in, she's 84 years old now. She's been in the temple since her husband passed when she was 22. 62 years? Continually. But it says it was an example and a reputation. A legacy and a reputation. When you start looking up that word just and devout, that word just and devout means righteous means that he was doing his best to live right before God. He was doing his best to be right with God at all times. Now, it, it talks about him being an older man. Give me that duct tape. Lord, help. I'm going to take the rest of the cord and just wrap it around here in a minute so we can hang on to it. He was doing everything he can to live just and devout. When you start looking at that word devout... That means that it, it became his reputation. It became his reputation. He knew that if he did something wrong, let's make atonement for it now. Let's make it right. He knew what the Levitical law and things said, so he did it. For you and me, as we read God's Word, as we study God's Word, what kind of legacy and what kind of reputation do we want others to talk about? I mean, here we're talking thousands of years later, and we're still talking about these two people. What about your grandkids? Those of you who's in here right now that's got grandkids, maybe some have got great grandkids. What kind of reputation or legacy do you want to leave for them? We were talking the other day at work about buying cars and stuff, and when I got ready to buy my first car, David, I, I just called down to First Bank of Boaz, where Daddy had always done business, and I believe it or not, Jordan, I got to talk to the president of the bank that quick. I told the receptionist, I said, this is David Galloway's son. I need to talk to Mr. Wooten. Um, I've got some questions for him. And she said, hold on one second. Let me see if he's available. The next person that picked up, Miss Nancy, that was Mr. Wooten, the bank president. He said, yes, sir. He said, this is David's son. I said, yes, sir, this is his middle son, Justin. Um, I started to work at this place, and I'm, I want to buy me a new truck or a newer truck. He said, all right. He said, once you found what you want, call me and tell me what it is, and we'll do the paperwork. And I said, do you... We need to do anything before? He said, nope, I know your dad. I know you'll make your payments or he'll beat you to death. <laughs> I was like, okay. He said, get whatever you want. I'm thinking, he just gave me a blank check, Sam. I can go buy what, whatever I want. He, and then I, went, I called, told daddy what he said, and he said, yep, he knows the truth. If you fail on a payment, he just calls me and I deal with you. 
I was like, okay. He said, because my name will co-sign on it just for proof, and then we'll move forward. I was like, okay. What kind of reputation do we have? If somebody calls the place that you used to work, for those of you who retired, if somebody calls the place you retired from, what would they have to say about you? Now, by the grace of God, I can honestly say every place that I've worked in the past, if the management's still there that I worked for, I had an open door to come back at any time. Which is all to God. All to God's glory. When I left Volkswagen coming out here, my boss is now over the battery plant next to it. When I talked to him a while back for reference, he told me, he said, you about ready to move back to Chattanooga? I said, not right now. And he said, well, when you're ready, call me. He said, I'm over here at the battery plant. He said, I'll put you to work over here for me. That's all God. It's all God. What kind of reputation and legacy do we want to leave? I don't want it to, just to be because of my name. I want my legacy and my reputation for Colt and Jordan. And if they ever have kids, hang on. <laughs> I want them to know that their granddaddy loved God with everything that he's got. Not just that I was a preacher, but Fred, I want them to know that I actually stood for what I believed. Now, they'll be the first ones to tell you I'm not perfect. But I want to get better with every day. I want to leave a reputation for those around me that points to him. And if you're still alive, it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, you can start working on that now. You can take the lesson of obedience and put it in with this and build towards your future so that when it comes your time to stand before your God and Savior, He can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And your family and friends left behind can say, man, what a legacy. You ever heard that old saying, there's some big shoes to fill now? But the next thing I want you to see, I want to see some examples of perseverance. Examples of perseverance. Perseverance simply means that you're continuing to push forward when things are going bad. You're continuing to walk the walk when it feels like all hell is breaking out around you. You're continuing to move forward with what God's given you to do and move forward with life when you don't feel like it. When it hurts. When it's painful. When everything's going crazy. Before I give you those... My wife turned 25 yesterday. I have had the honor and privilege for almost 20 years of doing life with her. Almost 20 years. Yes, she gets a medal of honor. <laughs> perseverance. She has been a perfect, she has been an amazing example of perseverance time and time and time and time again. Walking through some dark valleys. Being on the way when she got the call that her dad was in a motorcycle wreck, having to leave and go by herself because we had nobody at the time to keep their kids because they were little. Driving out to the other side, I think it was the other side of Kentucky, out that direction, by herself, only to find out she didn't make it before he went on. Knowing he was with God gave her comfort. But being able to go through that and the things that followed after that. To being there beside her mom when her mom passed away three year, almost three years ago now. And seeing that example that she lived in front of me and those two kids every day. Persevering when it hurt. Persevering when she lost her number. Her mom was, was, I, her mom was a cheerleader like nobody else. If any of, those, any of you in here got to see when she did a video with us with, with P4G when we were doing the college ministry, you were, and Jimmy's out there shaking his head, he got to watch it. Granny Goose, as we called her, sat down in a swing with me and she did a video. And this was while she was dealing with breast cancer, jumped in there and did a video with us talking about how she loved her God and how she served. Examples of perseverance. We talked about... Simeon just a minute ago, and it said that he had been told by God that he would not see death until he saw God's Holy One. He would not see death. Verse 26, we see that there... I jumped ahead. I don't need to give you spoilers. I don't want to give you spoilers. 
It says that he was told by the Spirit that he would not see death until he saw God's Holy One. He would not see death. So day in and day out, with the Spirit on him, he went back and forth to the temple. He went back and forth and he did the things he was supposed to, supposed to do. But you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Joe, you know that there were places in his mind that every time he'd show up to the temple, he'd see kids come in and go, Is that him? Is that him? I'm, I'm imagining David, him sitting there, and he's going through his stuff, and the family brings in another kid, and he's like, is that him? I mean, he was getting on up in age, and he's thinking, oh, it's about that time. I mean, you know, am, am I going to be having to be carried in here every day and sit down until he comes? But he persevered. He kept going. Surely, I'm sure he never got disappointed when it wasn't that child. Do you? Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one. Okay, it's not that one. Maybe... Oh. I'm just imagining myself a little bit. I would have been like, okay, I've been doing this for years and years. Like, you know, help me out here. Bring him in because I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm weary. I'm worn down. I'm struggling. I am hurting. Nope. But then you've also got Anna's example where she's been serving 62 years. And it says she ceased to not to leave the temple. She was there from sun up to sundown. She was doing anything and everything she could. I guarantee you, if she was there, she was praying with people. She was helping to carry the anointing oil. She was helping to do whatever she could. I'm sure you've all we've had these we've had these opportunities in churches where you've seen these older ladies and they're they're in there all the time and they're cleaning up the church and they're wiping down stuff and you know you never have to worry about anything around there because it's polished. We had some at the church we used to be at. If you borrowed the auditorium for something, be prepared because they were going to let you know if something was out of place. The flowers and stuff up there, Jordan, they had a yardstick from the front to side to side. No joke. This is how it's supposed to be. This is where we put this. This is where it needs to go back. Don't move it because we'll know. But she was there 62 years. 60 two years. She was getting on up in age, but yet she was still there every day serving God, taking care of business, making sure the house of God was where it needed to be so when somebody came, they got it. But when we look at this, we see some of the, some of the things that we need to persevere. We need to persevere because there's things that we've got to power on, but we're clinging, we're hanging, we're holding on to promises. Holding on to promises, we see that there's the promise of a bigger ear so that this thing stays on. We're fixing to move to a handheld if I, don't, if I can do that without throwing it. What kind of promises are you holding on to? One of the greatest promises we've got in God's Word is the promise of salvation. The promise of salvation that if I take my last breath right now, before my body hits the floor, I'm with my Father up above. The promise of salvation. We've got the promise of comfort. Not just comfort, but of the comforter. The moment we get saved, Jesus said, I've got to go to my Father. And if I go to my Father, I'll send who? The comforter. The Holy Spirit to move inside you. To comfort and strengthen you. We've got the promise of peace. When everything's going nuts and crazy in your life and you lose a loved one, you lose a job, you lose a home, you, you lose something, and that peace of God that the Bible says passes all understanding just moves in. Oh, yeah, it's dark outside right now. It's, it's dreary. It's bleak. You feel like you're in the middle of a class 5 hurricane. You're in the eye of the storm all of a sudden. I do still listen to some gospel from time to time, some southern gospel. I know that's, you know, not a lot of people's forte, but I, I still listen to some southern gospel. One of my favorite groups, they sung a song called The Eye of the Storm. And it says, David, he is the eye of the storm. When everything is going crazy, his eye is on you, and he is the center. He is the eye of the storm. He promises not only that, but he promises he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll not, never walk away from us. And if he could break a promise, he would no longer be God. He also gives us the promise that He's going to supply all of our needs. He may not promise you, He may not give you a brand, brand new Rolls Royce. He may never give me a Bugatti. Probably because I'd get hurt. He may never give you those kind of things, but He's going to give you exactly what you need. 
We also see that he gives us the promise of strength and hope. I can do all things through who? Christ Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. Somebody tell me another promise that you're holding on to. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart. Well, they, may, they may walk away for a little bit, but they ain't going to be able to go long because he's going to be right there with them. Perseverance. How many times have you heard a tale about somebody saying when they get older, they remember their mom or their dad praying over them at night? One of my preacher buddies, he started a church down in Columbus, Georgia. He said, man, he said, if I ever wanted to go do something wrong, I had to do it barefoot. I said, what do you mean? He said, do you know how many times I caught my mama praying over my shoes? Don't ever let these shoes, Lord, take him anywhere he shouldn't be. Stop his feet from walking in places that would hurt him. He said, if I wanted to get in trouble, he said, I'd do it barefoot. He said, because I knew them shoes would lock down to the floor and I couldn't go. He said, I'd be like one of those cartoon characters. How many times has a mother's prayer or has a wife's prayer come true and their husband, after so many years of living a life outside of God, come in? A well-known pastor down in South Florida years and years ago gave the example, and I'm per pretty sure I've told you all before. He said he had a, a guy in his church, or had a lady in his church, had been praying for her husband. He said it was like 30-something years. Every Sunday she would come to the altar and she would pray for her husband. Every Sunday. And he had made countless trips out there to witness to him. And every time he turned him away. And she came to him one Sunday and she said, Pastor, will you come visit him this week? She said, it may not do any good, but please come visit him again. And he said, all right. He said when he got there, he said the man had a beer in his hand sitting out on the front porch. And when he got there, the guy set it down and the pastor started talking. He looked at him and he said, Pastor, he said, I don't want anything that you've got to say. I don't want to hear anything about it picked it up and blew the froth off the beer in the pastor's face. He said, I walked away from there heartbroken because here's this lady who's been praying for him for years and he wants nothing to do with it. About two weeks later on a Saturday night, he gets a call late at night from her and she said, you're never going to believe what happened last night. He said, what do you mean? She said, you'll find out in the morning. He said, I'm thinking, okay, what? She made me a, he said, normally she would make me a cake or something and, you know, she'd make me a pie to thank me for coming. And he said, when I got there to church, I got ready to preach the next day. And in he walked with her, came down and they sat in the back. And he said, I'm sitting here thinking, what in the world? A.L., he did like most preachers. Fred, he took those notes of his and set them to the side. And he preached salvation with everything that he had. He preached his heart out for salvation and he preached it in as soon as he gave the invitation, the man came down to the front. And he's like, yeah, we got him now. He's reeling him in. Come on. He goes down there to the altar and he starts to pray with him and he starts to share the scriptures. And he looks at him and he says, you're too late, pastor. You know he was deflated all of a sudden, Miss Martha. All of a sudden he's thinking, I got him. I got him. <sighs> well, you mean I'm too late? You're still alive, aren't you? You've... He goes, I got saved Friday night. He said, tell me about it. He said, I woke up Friday night, and my wife wasn't in the bed next to me. He said, which, you know, wasn't uncommon, you know, because maybe, and he said, I waited there a few minutes, and the light was on in the bathroom. He said, but the door wasn't closed all the way. He said, so I started getting worried about her because this went on for a while. He said, I got up, and he said, I walked over to the bathroom, and the closer I got to it, I could hear her praying. And I peeked in, and she was knelt down in, in the floor big old tears just flowing and she's praying for her husband and his salvation and he said I'm standing there and all of a sudden all these years of hearing her pray and the gospel being presented and he said it just broke me he said tears started flowing down my face and he said I bust open the door and said baby I can't take it no more what do I need to do to get saved he knelt down on the toilet where he had spent many a year, many a times before, because he had drunk too much, he knelt down at that toilet and gave his heart and life to Jesus and was there that Sunday morning to come make it public. And for the rest of that man's life, every time they had a testimony or something, he would give his toilet testimony about how God saved him at the same throne where he used to go to all the time because he wasn't living right. Perseverance, trusting the promises of God.
Perseverance when everything's going crazy. Granny Goose, Whitney's mom, had breast cancer twice. The first time, she had the mastectomy. She went through the treatment. She was cleared for many years. First time she went through it, she did like a lot of us. It frustrated her. She got upset with God. She got bent out of shape. And she just, I mean, she was beside herself. God used several things during that to kind of help her. Whitney's dad got his life straight. He had been an alcoholic for years. He got his life straight. But by the time Granny went through it the second time, by the time it came back, it metastasized and went to the bones and some other stuff. And she started taking the medicine. But by this time, she had turned her life, which she had never walked away from God, but she had fully, completely devoted every moment she had. She was teaching Sunday school at her church. She was helping out with things around the church. And then as she went through cancer, she started going to a different treatment center than where she'd had hers done. And three to four times a week, she would go in there every week and she would minister to people. She would witness to people. She would pray with people. She would cry with people. She would go in there dressed up like a pirate. She would go in there with different kind of costumes just to make people smile and to make them laugh. All the while, she's hurting inside physically going through all that. But she did it time and time and time again. And you know what broke her heart the most? Was when it got to the point where she couldn't do that stuff. When she couldn't do it. But yet she kept praying for us. She kept praying for us. She kept praying for her family. She kept praying for those people. And she would call me at times. There were times I would get up and I would just be heading to work. And I'm heading to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I get a text from Granny. Now they're an hour behind us at 4 a.m. She's texting me. And she said, baby, I just want you to know I'm praying for you today. I love you and I'm praying for you. Just little things like that. We got to see her when she was fixing to go home to be with the Lord. And one point in time in that, she looked at us and she said, he's late. So what do you mean he's late? And she said, I've been ready to go home for days. He's late. She said, I'm ready to go home. I have fought the fight. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to go see him. She gave us an example of perseverance that lined up with these completely. She gave us an example of legacy to follow. She gave us an example of obedience. Man, you'll get to see it before too long. Whitney inherited her mom's Mustang, but everybody around town knew that, pink, that black Mustang. She's got a 2008 Warriors in pink model. It's got the breast cancer logo and all that. But there was a lady at the Popeyes down the road. She used to go get breakfast there all the time. Was it Popeyes or Bojangles? Popeyes. That lady there come to love Granny like it was her own because she came up one day and saw that lady broken. She asked her what was going on and she was telling her, you know, she was trying not to pour mouth, but she was telling her about the struggle she was going through. Granny reached in her billfold and handed her a hundred dollar bill and she said, here, use it. And the lady didn't know what to do. But that just became part of her legacy she left, just trying to be a blessing to people. Every time she turned around, she was doing stuff like that. If you get to looking in God's Word, there are thousands and thousands of promises in God's Word. But there's roughly 7,500 promises that God makes to us. Specifically from God to us. 7,500 promises. If you're going through something, if you're struggling with something, I guarantee you of that 7,500, you're going to find something that applies to where you're at, something to give you strength, something to help you persevere and keep moving forward for Him instead of giving up. You see, it's easy to give up. It's easy to, to turn and start going the other direction. But is the cost in the end going to be what you want to pay? Remember, sin will take you further than you want to go to keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. So we've got those examples where they're persevering through, they're powering through, they're holding on, they're clinging with all they've got. Are we waiting on God's promises to come to pass or are we just kind of giving up? Man, I've been fighting this fight for years and now I'm just tired. I'm weary. I'm worn out. But he can't forget. It's not his nature. He can't forget about a promise. He can't walk away from a promise. So we see the example of obedience. 
the example of legacy and reputation, the example of perseverance. So, here's my rabbits. If you go back and you look into those stories, and you look in at verse number 32, and he said that it's a lot to lighten the Gentiles. Simeon is standing up there in front of them, and he's quoting Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand and keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Now, maybe it's not grabbing you like it did me, but let me step back and remind you, who are the Gentiles? Us. Us. Thank you, Bob. There, had two, there was mainly two people he talked about. Who were the other ones? The Jews. The Jews were God's chosen people in the beginning. The Jewish nation was the one he had his hand on. But, but, but unless you were a Jew, you were kind of what? You were kind of out, Right? But even in the book of Isaiah, he said it's going to be a lot to the Gentiles. So when we get into this one, he says a lot to lighten the Gentiles. It's to brighten up the Gentiles' path. It's to open up the way for you and me. And see, that got me excited, David, because I realized that even then, he's referring back to me having a hope. To me having a possibility. I mean, for those of you who don't know, my last name's Galloway. That's not a Jewish name. There's nothing about that Jewish you follow my ancestors back. There's nothing Jewish about any of them. Bunch of horse trading thieves. A lot for the Gentiles. Then in verse number 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Let that grab you for a second. He says to open blind eyes. We were not allowed at that point in time to see the gospel. It was not allowed to us. He says to open those blind eyes to bring out the prisons, prisoners from prison. Think about that. Where were you at? What was your life like when God found you? What was your life like when you got saved? You were in a prison. We were in prison. We were in prison to our shame. We were in prison to our sin. We were in prison because the, the principality of this world, Satan himself, had us locked up because he didn't want our eyes open. He didn't want us coming out of his prison. He is wanted him, he wanted us to stay with him. But God opened our eyes. God shone a light. He brightened our path. He gave us a way. He's referring back to this and he's talking about Jesus as he's holding him. Think about that too. He's holding up the Son of God. He got to put, not just see him, he got to put his hands on him. He got to hold up Jesus Christ and hold him up and look at him. And then he started referring back to the Old Testament saying, He's going to lighten and bring light to the Gentiles. He's going to bring light to the whole entire world. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Come down to man to pay the ultimate price. When you look at verse 38, he finishes up with this. Actually, this was Anna's. Anna down at the end, she leaves him and it says that she went out and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption. She went out and all the Jewish nation, they were still looking for that redemption. They were still looking for that Savior. They were still looking to be redeemed. And you start looking at the word redeemed. It goes back to Romans Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. She's saying that redemption, this redemption comes from Jesus Christ. This child that I just saw, He's going to be the redemption for me. He's going to be the light for me. He's going to be the hope for me. Redemption. To deliver by paying a price. It's a New Testament doctrine. In the Old Testament, there was atonement that had to be made frequently to keep covered. In the New Testament, we talk about redemption. This one time, one, one payment that covered it all. We have been delivered because Jesus paid the price. Now, there's three words in the Bible that are translated for redemption. I listened to these words being pronounced multiple times, but if I mess them up, you go listen to them and see if you can get it better. I'm sure some of you can. The first one, egrazo, egrazo means to purchase in the market. 
The underlying thought is of a slave market sold under sin and sentenced to death. When Jesus found us, we were in the slave market to sin. Now if you think back into those times, they sold slaves at an open market. And the slave could have been anyone, whether it could have been you or me or somebody else. It had nothing to do with whatever color or skin. It had everything to do with the fact that we were sold into sin. At this time, it could have been because you couldn't pay your debts. So you became a slave to the person you couldn't pay your debts to. And they may decide all of a sudden they're done with you. Take you to the market and sell you to somebody else. And then they recoup part of their money and they move on. But once you were in that kind of market, your life was done. You stayed in that livelihood unless somebody was forgiving enough to let you work your way out of it. In most cases, once you became into those kind of markets, you were done for life. A grazo talks about to be purchased in the market. But you get to the other one, exagrazo. Exagrazo means to buy out of the market. The redeemed are never exposed to sell again. Once you were bought out of that market, by the Redeemer, you never had to go back to it again. You never had to go back to it again. And then it leads to the third one. Lutro. Lutro. Lutro means to loose, to set free by paying a price. Now, the three words that are translated, when you look into those, they give you the example all the way around. It says you've been bought from the market. You don't ever have to go to the market. And now he's turned you loose. He set you free. Let that sink in. You've been bought from the market of sin where it wanted to hold you in. It wanted to keep you back. It wanted to sentence you to death, which is eternal separation from God. And it has set you free from the market. You never have to go back there again. And it turns you loose so that you can just move on. You have your redemption papers. You can wave them anytime somebody says something and says, I'm loose, I'm free, I'm gone. I don't have to be that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to give in to that anymore. I've been set free. We used to sing the old song back home, Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I am saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. He gave us examples, and then He gave us some encouragement, some charge in the middle of it. When we go looking at this all the way through, He gives us things that will help us, take care of us, and watch us over each and every step. We have examples. We have the example of obedience. We have the examples of legacy and reputation. We have the example of perseverance. And then He gave us a lot and a redemption. I have no doubt... Not a single person came in here today without a care, concern, worry. <coughs> Lane's home today. Messed up his sciatic nerve. Can't, couldn't halfway get around, so he's at home today. Not a one person, not a single person came here without a concern or care or worry. If you did, you're the rarity. There is always something going on in everybody's life where you need something from God. Feel like you're by yourself? Feel like you've been lost in a, in a sea? You feel like, feel like you're struggling, you're fighting an uphill battle? Feel like you need some peace, some encouragement, some strength? Feel like you're doing all you can, but you need something from Him. He is all and then some. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Micah's going to come up and play something. I want you to think about what God's given you today. This is one of those examples that hit home. Something you need to be praying about. Use your chairs and altar if you want to. You're more than welcome to come up front. If you need prayer, come up front and somebody will pray with you. If you're not sure about this God that we've been talking about... Man, we would love to be able to share him with you, to tell you about him. Father, you see us as we're here today. Lord, I needed this today. God, I needed the encouragement you gave me today. Lord, there are words that you had today that you gave me today that I hadn't even thought about. I am thankful for that. I needed it, Father. 
I ask you, Lord, that you will just move from one end to the other and help this not to be something that we hear and leave, but something that we take with us. Oh, God, help us today. As we stand, he's going to sing, lead a song. If you need to, as you need to just keep praying or you need to come to the altar, please do. If you will, just stand with us. Thank you for being here and being a part of the service today. Please, I ask, take some of this with you. It wasn't something for me. It was something from God. Take it with you and let it be a part of your life and let it sink in. You can use it this week to help us. Hope that you have a great week. Please be careful, and we'll see you next week, Lord willing. And if you need something, just reach out to us. So have a great day, and thank you very much. That was good.